Hello, and welcome back everyone. I'm holding a 5C collet, and it fits into this lathe chuck, which has a D3 backplate. It fits both the Colchester and the Sheraton. This is a Crawford multi-bore collet chuck. Again, it's a D3 mount, but I can't get any collets for it, so I can't use it. This is the newest standard of collets being used on lathes. It's an ER40. It's much better than a 5C as the collet grips along the entire length of the compression area, whereas the 5C collet has most of the gripping pressure applied at the tip of the collet. The ER collet chuck I use is fitted with a D3 backplate for mounting directly onto the low spindle. Again, this fits both the Colchester and the Sheraton. I have another collet chuck, but it's a D4. And although I don't have a spindle that size, I have an idea to put it to good use. The spindle on my big lathe is a D8, and today's challenge is to mount this chuck onto this spindle. G'day, I'm Steve-O, and welcome to the Outback Shed. The faceplate for this lathe shows a size problem. The collet chuck is 125mm in diameter, while the spindle size for the lathe is 220 This chuck actually fits inside the taper mount for the spindle. I have a piece of 6061 aluminium which is 280mm by 85mm and it will do nicely for making into a backplate. However, I have a few spare face plates and they already have the spindle mount machined. Rather than convert a nice piece of aluminium into a large amount of swarf, I'll use a spare face plate and convert it to a backplate for the collet chuck. I'll need to reduce the diameter to a manageable size. And as the speed rating for the faceplate is low, reducing the diameter will allow the chuck to be used at higher speeds. I could cut it with a bandsaw, but mine only cuts horizontal. Or I could cut it with an angle grinder, but that's a bit agricultural. So I'll tree pan it. I'll put a pair of sacrificial parallels onto the mill table. Their sizes are relatively unimportant. What matters is that they are identical. I machined them together from some aluminium offcuts I had on the shelf. They were a good rainy afternoon project and they're very useful. I do need to give them a clean up at some point, but they will be fine for today. I've mounted the faceplate over a centre boss that bolts to the table. This way I can remove the outer strap clamps and rotate the plate while still maintaining plate on centre. I have a pair of machinist jacks at the clamping point to secure the edges the parallels are located underneath the spindle mount and that is not even with the outer rim. Using a 16mm solid carbide end mill, I'll slice in between the slots. This is nice cast iron and it's cutting very well. You didn't really think I was going to tree pan it in the lathe did you? Well, it's the same thing. I'm just using a mill which as we all know it's just a lathe standing on its end. I'm leaving some small tabs at the bottom of some of the cuts to provide structural integrity to the plate. I don't want it to move or break free on the last cut. Cast iron tends to cut well if a robust cut is taken. Finer finishing cuts tend to produce a powdery swarf, but all cuts produce some fines which linger in the atmosphere. So a dust mask is appropriate and I use a vacuum where possible.
I'll now separate the two pieces with a hammer and chisel. Mounted onto the lathe, I'm using a 10mm high speed steel tool bit to clean up the milled edge and bring it to round. Carbide inserts just don't like interrupted cutting. I have the lathe well covered and I'm using a vacuum to catch the fines and as much swarf as possible. I've moved the vacuum pipe out a little to allow the camera to see the cut. Normally it will be right on top of the tool to pick up as much swarf as possible. Now back to the mill. The first job will be to centre the spindle over the hole. I prefer an electronic centre finder for rounded internal faces as the wobbles can be a little hard to read due to the curvature of the hole. The smaller the hole, the greater the curvature and the harder they are to read. Next, I want to make sure that the orientation of the plate has the remnants of one of the T-slots directly on the X-axis. I'll make a plunge cut to verify the location, then move the spindle back to the centre point of X equals 0 and Y equals 0. I want to make a series of plunge cuts around the circumference of the plate to make it easy to spin the chuck by hand during setups. The plate had 12 slots and I reckon I can get two plunges in between each so that makes a total of 36. The pitch circle diameter of 235mm I got from the previous plunge and that's reapplied here. The DRO shows a graphic location of each plunge and the XY coordinates for each. It's just a matter now of setting the depth and plunging each in turn, moving the strap clamps as needed. I have an inverter fitted to the knee on this mill, so I could use a power feed, but I'd prefer to maintain a manual feed for these cuts. After the final plunge, I'll change to a 3 quarter inch high speed steel end mill to widen the curves. Then it's back to the lathe and I'll clean up the edges and bring it to size.
Note to self, stop mounting the camera on the mill table. I'll use a form tool to round out a groove to provide a push point for a block of wood. A mallet and a wooden block are often needed to dislodge the chuck for removal as they can stick to the spindle nose, making removal difficult. Final chamfer on the front edge and I'll face off the plate. The collet chuck will be recessed into the back plate, so I need to cut a relief for it. Although cast iron is a nice material to work with, it's very messy and dirty, and it's hard on inserts. I'll change to a new cutting edge before making the final cut. I'm making the relief half a millimetre oversize as I need some wriggle room to centre the chuck when I mount it. Next, I need to drill and tap six 8mm holes in the back plate for the mounting holes. 
I'll draw these at a pitch circle diameter of 95 millimeters. To get the best accuracy from this chuck, I'm making it a set true so I can dial it in like a 4 jaw chuck before tightening the cap screws. I've clamped the back plate to an angle plate so I can draw four 5mm holes right through to the centre and then thread the outside to take a 6mm grub screw. As I made 36 plunges, I can easily index the plate simply by advancing the rotation by 9 curves. Next, I need to draw and counterball the 6 holes in the chuck. I've mounted the chuck onto a circular parallel, which is the outer race of an old bearing. I didn't like this setup, so I changed it for three 40mm bearing rollers and recentered the spindle. The settings are the same, six holes on a pitch circle diameter of 95mm.
The chuck is made from tool steel and it's pretty hard. I'm using 8% cobalt drill bits and it's fair to say that they don't like it. They need a lot of cutting oil. Note to self, again, stop mounting the camera on the mill table. Now it's over to the Colchester to machine four 5mm push rods for the chuck adjustment. These are a little under 5mm to allow clearance through the hole and they're 35mm long. I'm showing one rod here, I made the other three off camera. The 6mm grub screws fit nicely and you can now see where the push rods fit and how the setup will work. I use compressed air to clean the parts, but they still need a wipe of the tissue. The cap screws are stainless steel and they give a nice finish to the build. Mounted back on the spindle, I can now dial the chuck in just as I would with a four jaw chuck.
I've got to the point where I can't really see any movement in the needle, so I'll change to a high resolution test style indicator. This one measures microns, that's a thousandth of a millimetre. I'll gradually increase the tightness of the cap screws while still making adjustments. I've got around 3 microns, I can't get any better than that, and that's about 2 ten thousandths of an inch. That is if you believe the indicator. I have a set of high accuracy collets and I'll use these for these chucks. I would prefer not to use the collets I use in the mill. Time to test it. I'll mount a new 20mm collet and insert a 4 Morse taper arbor. It has a ground finish so it's a good surface to test and it's about the roundest item I have. I'm moving the stylus around on the arbor to see if there are any changes. The indicator is showing a total indicator run out of between 3 and 5 microns. I'm unsure how much credibility to give that as it's a cheap indicator and not a known brand. However it does seem to agree with the yellow measure max indicator which is a good brand. That said I'm very happy with the result. This chuck makes a great addition to this lathe. I have several 3 and 4 dual chucks and a faceplate, so it has a high level of versatility. This build has provided a good outcome for a faceplate that I had no use for. I still have a couple more spare, so there may be other opportunities for repurposing them in future projects. As always, thanks for watching. I hope you liked this video and found it of value. If so, please consider subscribing and liking. In the meantime, be productive, be creative, but most importantly, be safe in your shed. Catch you next time.